Hello, welcome to the session on literary criticism. I will be dealing with the module 2 and in that I will be taking the Renaissance criticism and neoclassical criticism. Today, in this lecture, uh, we will be dealing with Renaissance criticism, that too, the introduction to Renaissance criticism. So what about the word Renaissance? Renaissance means the revival of classical literature and knowledge. Classical Greek and Roman literature and knowledge basically. Renaissance which concerns the revival and rebirth of classical knowledge and learning originated in Italy and disseminated into England marking a new era in English literature and criticism. The influence of Renaissance as critic Habib observes, revamped the medieval theological point of view, swapping it with a secular and humanist vision, endorsing fresh interest in the secular world in sociocultural terms, attesting new significance to the, I quote, individual, all inspired by a rediscovery of the classics, unquote. So basically, Renaissance is the rediscovery or re-reading of classics, classics, literature, knowledge and any type of um, this classical text. So as we mentioned earlier, Renaissance criticism is the aftermath of the revival of Greek and Roman culture known as humanism. So Renaissance literary criticism took its roots in defense of poetry and dialogues on language and literary imitation in Italy in the 14th and 15th centuries. It reached maturity, however, and achieved a kind of independent discourse in the 16th century Italy, where, where the recovery of this Aristotle's poetics, you can see that a couple of uh, literary uh, works happened on, our, on Aristotle's poetics, a re-reading of Aristotle's poetry, poet, poetics. One of the most important among them is Lodovico Castelvetro's commentaries on poetics. Also, there was an Italian version of the explanation for poetics and what happened is that after examining the ideas that are mentioned in poetics or the rules regarding the poetry, unity to, uh, unities of time and other uh, things, the um, critics have started analyzing or applying this um, theories to the poetic works. For example, you can see the application of comprehensive theories of poetry to vernacular works by Dante, Ariosto, Tasso, etc. So what happened was the, 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 um, there was a tendency to read uh, the rules um, and regulations and the way a poetry is considered as um, good. All those things are written and mentioned in Aristotle's poetics. These things were re-read and there was a tendency to apply all those things that they have read into the uh, literary works of that particular period. And they started analyzing, okay, whether the unities of time and um, other things are being met by Ariosto or Dante or whoever they are taking the work as an example. So this is uh, what happened then. The influence of Italian criticism spread swiftly across Europe where critics like Joachim, Du Bellay and Philip Sidney enlisted it. So Philip Sidney is one of the most important critics of Renaissance criticism and we will be, we'll be dealing with him in detail later in, in the later lectures. Uh, yeah, until then you just um, keep these names in your mind. So along with the other resources of humanism, the establishment of vernacular traditions of literature and criticism also became strong at this point of time. Okay, so fundamentally classical Renaissance criticism shows, uh, showcases its debits to Horace, Aristotle and Plato roughly in that honor, uh, order. That means the Renaissance criticism actually took ideas from Horace, Aristotle and Plato. So basically they brought in this idea of imitation and the unity of time uh, and they started analyzing the works on behalf of these uh, critical aspects. 
but it was the questions left unanswered by these authorities that crucially led renaissance critics to synthesize, synthesize adapt and extend classical poetics to meet the demands of contemporary writing uh, going back to dandy for example going back to dandy their first priority was the defense of poetry against uh, the ancient and modern opponents and the defense of the vernacular as a poetic medium defending poetry entailed defining it establishing its formal criteria both of which hinged on imitation as i told you they gave undue importance to the uh, the theory of imitation by aristotle so uh, tracing the ideas from aristotle critics tend to define poetry itself as an imitation the status source and purpose of which they debated to other classical philosophers critics and rhetorician so this is what happened then they took the ideas directly from aristotle and started applying it in the works vernacular works also they took ideas from horace uh, and also there was a tendency tendency of uh, taking this uh, formal uh, of course aristotle's you can call it as a formalistic approach where the structure was given more importance than the um, this theme so this formalist they took the formalistic principles of aristotle's also and such a rhetorical treatises as the instituto oratorio of quintilian and uh, certain critics such as uh, this julius caesar scaliger composed works based on these ideas and one of the most important work is encyclopedia artis poetici this is one of the most important work that uh, was uh, inspired by uh, written inspired by horace aristotle um, and other classics of that time so this work actually sought unprecedented ways to sympathize the art of poetry with standards of prosody figure and genre derived from classical models that of course you um, know that all these uh, i guess you have already done with aristotle where you will you might have learned about his theories how he is giving importance to the structure of uh, uh, of uh, poetic content so that was given most importance in these works especially this uh, julius caesar scaliger's work was a kind of experimentation in this um, uh, sense then the nature of in renaissance english criticism in many aspects as it evolved differed from modern concept of criticism because it mirrored the spirit of its age of course it uh, reveals uh, i quote um, i quote um, uh, habib um, critic habib so it, uh, it reveals the civic values a sense of national identity and a sense of place in history especially as gauged in relation to the classics unquote so these critical texts normally assume a structure of dialogue to assert its individuality from the from other critical point of views renaissance criticism formulates a defense of literature or an apology against a particular author or genre so you can see this defense of literature or defense of poetry in a broader sense in sydney's apology for poetry that definitely we'll be dealing with in the coming uh, lecture sessions okay so um, basically i hope you got an idea this is um, this renaissance criticism uh, of course look in look deeper into this classical um, uh, sense classical values and also it gives more importance to the literariness of the text as well as the structure um, of that um, structure and poetic techniques were also given more importance then coming to the critical works no critical work worth mentioning appeared in england till the middle of the 16th century so um, but still there were so many um, certain works which can be considered as critical works that we are just um, looking into here uh, these can't be considered basically these are not exactly critical works where you can find uh, some sort of critical theories or something like that but still they can they can be considered as predecessors of uh, sydney's critical work which is considered as one of the most important critical work of renaissance period so one example is renaissance defense literature so where model don boccaccio's genealogy of the gentile gods in italy and followed by joachim du bellay's defense and illustration of the french language 
and this was um, written of course in uh, French and of course Philip Sidney's Apology and Apology for Poetry. So uh, these were modeled on uh, Boccaccio's genealogy of the Gentile uh, gods. So these are some of the most important critical works that happened um, at that time. It was only after the Renaissance when the classical uh, Greek and Latin treatises on criticism were made available to English scholars as they began to apply their minds to criticism in um, um, their minds to criticism in general, a kind of critical thinking in general. The first um, group of critics uh, of that time were Sir John J.K., Roger Esham and Thomas Wilson, first group of critics worth mentioning at that time, Renaissance critics. On the other hand, they were uh, devoted um, scholars of the classics, um, equally devoted to this uh, native English tradition, that is uh, this uh, vernacular language, uh, because they gave more importance to the poetry of Chaucer and all those medieval literature. Um, so this uh, tendency you can see in their works. On the other hand, they adore the classics as model for guidance. And on the other, they advocate uh, the purity of the native tongue from, uh, from foreign influences like Latin, French and Italian. So also, one may argue that the birth of Renaissance criticism begins with the rediscovery of classical text. Uh, for example, most notably, as we mentioned earlier, Aristotle's Poetics. The real reading of um, this poetics happened at that time and that's most important. So first of all, there came a Latin translation. As we all mentioned, the uh, importance of vernacular language was increasing. So there come, came a Latin translation of Aristotle's poetic by, by Giorgio Valla. And uh, that was in 1498. And uh, by 1549, uh, the poetics has been rendered into Italian as well. Uh, so these two years as well as the points are important. Latin translation as well as the Italian translation. And um, the most important among them is this uh, Lodovico Castelvetro's translation. And um, who it is not exactly translation, it is, um, it, it is considered as commentaries on Aristotle's poetics that was published in 1570. He was the most important and influential among the Renaissance critics. And also his work is, all, um, is also given a prominent place among all these translations, the Latin Italian translation, this is considered as the most important among um, the poetics translation, Tra not, uh, translation with some sort of commentary we can say. That's why commentary is on Aristotle's poetics. Now, uh, a group of 16th century French writers uh, who were known as played notably Pierre de Ronsard and Joachim du Bellay, we have already mentioned about him. Uh, brought in classicism, individualism and promoted purified vernacular language. So this is important. These are the people who actually worked for or, um, promoting vernacular language. The ideas of the Italian and French Renaissance were transmitted to England by Roger Esham, uh, George Gascoigne, Gascoigne then uh, Philip Sidney and others. So. Uh, Asham and Gascoigne are two important prose writers of the time and Sidney, um, major poet as well as critic. You'll be learning in detail about these things. Now coming to the, this is, uh, when you look into the 16th and 17th century, English criticism has actually passed through many distinct stages of uh, development, especially when it uh, comes to this Renaissance period, uh, it, uh, it has four stages. The first stage was characterized by a purely rhetorical study of literature, uh, probably beginning with Leonard Cox's art or craft of rhetoric. The, since this is uh, this, uh, all these are in Middle English spelling, you find this uh, difficult spelling over here. So this can be actually used as a uh, handbook for young scholars uh, for studying literature. This was followed by Wilson's Art of Rhetoric, which was published in 1553. It's a more extensive and certainly more original than Koch's text, more extensive about um, the critical study of literature. Actually, it is. Um, it also consists of the, uh, of the criticism of language too. Not only literature, it um, also talks about the language, poetic language that is being used. It was at this time that English writers, for the first time, began to appreciate form and style to be 
the distinguishing features of literature otherwise we were giving more um, importance to the content but now form and style has also become important this appreciation led to the formation of a new english prose style which is um, um, which more focuses on the form as well as style rather than the content now coming to the second stage of um, renaissance criticism it's a period of classification and especially of uh, the study of meter happened meter rhyme rhythm etc and it uh, starts with gascony's notes of instruction concerning the making of verse which was published in 1575 this is um, um, besides this work this brief work uh, it includes puttenham's art of english poesy which was published in 1589 and this also uh, consists of the classification of poetic forms and subjects and rhetorical figures okay classification of poetic forms and subjects and rhetorical figures then uh, and also it exhorts on the uh, importance of rhetorical skills for the courtiers who find rhetoric as a means of access towards their objectives of privilege and power R uh, rhetoric of course you know it's a power of speech okay so this is all about the second stage of english criticism so you can uh, understand that in the second stage more importance was given to this uh, rhetoric then now comes other important works that happened in the second stage one is on grammar Th that is bullock's a uh, book at large and brief grammar for english so this is the first systematic treatise on english grammar we would say Uh, and also there were um, other important works like harvey william harvey's letters and webby's discourse of english poetry and these two are considered as the first systematic approaches towards the classical um, um, classification of meters in english poetry this stage was characterized by the study and classification of practical questions of language as well as versification both regarding poetry the study of the verse forms introduced into england from italy help to especially this is about the meter um, of course when you study meter you know that of the this friends between petrarch and sonnet and shakespeare and sonnet and all and you know that all these um, the petrarch who who is petrarch and um, how he introduced these sonnets into it so these are different verse forms we'll be looking into the italian prosodist thus became the masters of the english students of this era the now coming to the third stage third stage is characterized by the period of philosophical and apologetic criticism as exemplified by sir philip sidney's defense of poesy which was published in 1595 it was written like uh, some 5 years back but published only after his death though um, yeah the yeah, so this uh, it is about um, all those uh, philosophy um, and uh, certain theoretical aspects about how to write a um good poetry okay so the third stage is famous for sydney's works philosophy and on apologetic criticism daniel's defense of rhyme and other few are also contemporary treatises that actually got published at that time these works as their titles indicate are all defenses or apologies and uh, were called forth by the attacks of the puritans on poetry then especially dramatic poetry and the text of the classicist on english versification and rhyme sydney's contemporaries had studied the general theory of poetry not for the purpose of enunciating rules or dogmas of criticism but chiefly uh, their work is to defend poetic art and to understand the fundamental principles uh, behind writing good poetry so now coming to the fourth stage ben johnson critic ben johnson is the main exponent and of course you know that sometimes this overlaps that uh, some critics or literary um, theorists will um, add ben johnson along with take ben johnson to the neoclassical age he actually acts as a bridge you can't actually place him exactly in the renaissance period it, it this uh, uh, actually um, comes in this in the middle of this 16th century so ben, ben johnson sometimes we consider him as a uh, what precursor of neoclassicism so he occupies the first half of the 17th century that is why this confusion arises 
the period that proceeded it was the general um, it was in general um, generally romantic in its tendencies that period because it was the first half of 17th century so the uh, tendencies in literature slightly changes at that time the literary criticism of the renaissance developed classical ideas of unity of form and content into neoclassicism proclaiming literature as centered to culture entrusting the poet and the author with their responsibility to preserve a long literary tradition which grew directly from the recovery of classic texts and uh, classic texts like of course uh, you remember the translation of aristotle's poetics so the recovery of classic text that happened at that time and the uh, and uh, in the second stage we learned that rhetoric was given being given at most importance and this was a tendency that uh, was prevalent at the time of aristotle plato horace etc rhetoric a person who has good rhetoric skills were given at most importance in among the academician so this uh, that tendency prevailed at that times this came back during this renaissance period uh, rhetoric a central element in the classical system of education got its prominence again during the renaissance period it may be defined of course rhetoric may be defined uh, formally if you have to define a rhetoric it may be defined as the formal study of techniques for composing and delivering orations including working up the argument uh, organization style delivery and memory that's how we will define rhetoric it can be defined as a study of formal techniques for composing and delivering orations how to keep up an argument how to organize and the style of delivery memory etc so this was a central element in the classical system of education and now it got its prominence back during the renaissance period and the this uh, the idea of imitation gave rise to heated debates over which model of um, poetic principles that are to be imitated uh, for example the question of which um, the, the of uh, there were uh, of which models to imitate that is how gave rise to heated disputes over the imitation of cicero the works of cicero the employment of uh, and there the employment of qualitative meter and rhyme you can see uh, and there were discussions on how to standardize the employment of quantitative meter um, then um, how to analyze its quality a rhyme scheme style of romance and epic that became a part of discussion and debate so this uh, all these things happened as a result of this um, renaissance criticism so we can say that the renaissance literary criticism reflects the intellectual culture of the age by confronting at every turn the complex dynamics of imitation both practically as well as theoretically so that's all about that's all about the introductory uh, lecture in about renaissance criticism so hope you all understood the important point first of all the renaissance rereading of classics and uh, analyzing the works in terms of this um, uh, knowledge um, reread knowledge and people started actually um analyzing the works of dante tasso etc by uh, with the help of all this um, theories that they got or the ideas that they got from uh, got from aristotle plato horace and all and there um, basically there are like four stages in the first stage um, uh, it it was characterized purely by the study of um, literature especially this uh, poetic techniques and all and uh, it's about poetic language second stage gave importance to the rhetoric um, and the third stage is characterized by the period of philosophy and apologetic criticism that which you will be learning in detail with uh, philip sidney and in the fourth stage you can see the ben johnson it started showing the neoclassical tendencies as well as uh, the tradition of poetry was also changing to uh, changing um, to its um, it was kind of changing and tending towards some other uh, uh, basically this holds a like medieval tendency of romanticism it changes to some other uh, aspect that is the neoclassical tendency has been shown and this form uh, the uh, the literary criticism of renaissance developed classical ideas of unity of form and content into literary neoclassicism all this happened in the fourth stage and uh, so as an immediate outcome we can say that the idea of imitation then the importance to this uh, rhetoric and uh, the employment of this quantitative and qualitative analysis of the meter rhyme uh, scheme rhythm style of romance etc 
the all these things happen during the time of renaissance criticism so stay tuned we will be dealing with philip sidney's critical contributions in the next lecture thank you